Hello everyone, welcome to online, our online service this week. We're so glad you can be tuning in with us from wherever you are. No one would disagree that we are living in trying times. Since March of last year, we've yo-yoed in and out of lockdowns, we've felt crushed by daily life, uh, our heads are spinning trying to keep up with all the current rules. And now, on top of all that, everywhere we turn, there's a different opinion on the vaccine. It's no wonder we're feeling lost and confused. Today we are hitting pause on our Christian Doctrine series to have a look at how we, as Christians, are called to respond to the situations we find ourselves in and to build a biblical framework to think through these tough topics like ongoing restrictions and vaccination. We're going to be reading a few chapters from Romans, for, uh, from Romans today and I want to start with Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. It's good to think through the how and why of our response to the pandemic under the overarching goal of living lives that are holy and pleasing to God. That should be our ultimate goal in all things. That is how we truly worship God. Through all the trials and hardships that life throws our way, including this ongoing pandemic, we can be sure that our God remains the same. Our faithful, gracious and merciful God stands unchanging through all eternity and we can stand firm in life by holding on to that truth. Let's acknowledge this together through song.
one of the promises we can be sure of is that God hears us when we pray. So please join me as we do that now. Almighty God, thank you that in worship we can put aside the uncertainties of this world and rest upon the certainties of you and your promises. We take comfort in knowing that you are in control of all things, that not a single leaf or feather or strand of hair will fall without your knowledge. At a time when life feels dark and troubled and what was once routine is now unpredictable, you continue to guide us and your steadfast nature comforts and encourages us. Your sovereignty over all things gives us reason to rejoice, even on our darkest days. Lord, though you are faithful to us, we recognise that all too often we fail to meet your standard. We sin against each other through selfish actions, hurtful words and unsavoury thoughts. We sin against you through pride, envy and greed. We worship the things you created instead of you, the creator of heaven and earth. We are sorry for our sins, Lord. We know we don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve your grace and mercy, but you offer it freely through Jesus' death and resurrection. Your love for us runs so deep that you sent your son to die in our place, that whoever believes in him would be saved. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we're going to hear our kids talk. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Meg. And hi, kids. Do you know what I have in the back seat of my car all the time? I have this first aid kit. And uh, it's always at the ready in case something goes wrong because you never know. You can be driving along on the road and something could go wrong with someone else or something could go wrong with the people in your car or something could go wrong when you get to the picnic spot you're going to. And so we have our first aid kit. Because when something goes wrong, I think there are three things that I like to do. One is God has given us some skills to fix it. And so you use what tools you've got, and I've got my wonderful first aid kit, to fix it as best you can. And that's number one. So we've got band-aids and medicines and mucuricombs and tapes and all sorts of good things in here. But number two is, well, you pray. Um, you pray because God can always help you in your time of trouble in the, when things have gone wrong. And number three is you trust that the Lord has got this under control. Now, I'm mentioning this because we all know that for some time now, there's been a virus going around the world. And so we have had to do what we can to fix it. And at the moment, uh, some governments have said, these are the ways we do things. And so if you've been going to school, you can't go to school anymore. You just do that online at home. Uh, we do things to fix it. And there are going to be medicines that are available. And maybe your mum and your dad have already had something of that. Um, we do what we can to fix it. We pray uh, because the Lord can help. And number three is we trust that the Lord is in control. We're going to be talking about that later in our service, but for now, why don't we pray? And then we're going to sing about how the Lord is in control. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made us in such a way that when problems come, uh, we can often fix them with the things that you have given us. Uh, Father, we also know that you are the one who helps us at all times in all circumstances. So help us to be people of prayer, and we pray uh, that you would help us uh, in these times, uh, fix the spread of the virus um, so that we can return to a normal way of life that we have come to enjoy. And finally, Father, we uh, trust always that you are in control. And whilst things, things can interrupt our life and um, we can't do the things we want, to, we want to be able to do, Lord, we know that you are still in control, you're sovereign, and you will bring about your wonderful and good purposes through the Lord Jesus we long and wait for that time when it's fulfilled fully and finally in heaven, the new creation that you will bring through him. Amen. Well, let's sing The Lord is King. You might have seen bad things happening on the TV news You might be worrying about the world and wonder what'll happen to you well, Put your 
but trust in God alone, cause he's still sitting on his mighty throne, and the Lord is king, he's gonna look after everything, everything, the Lord is king, he's gonna look after everything, every single thing in this world. Get sad and wonder why there's so much pain. Why we let the same mistakes happen over and over again. Our sinful ways will always fail, but God in His ways will prevail because the Lord is King. He's gonna look after it. He knows he'll judge in fearsome majesty. The blessed are all who find their place in the shelter of his grace. Because the Lord is king, he's gonna look after everything, everything. The Lord is king, he's gonna look after everything. As we come to pray again, we're going to use the Lord's Prayer as a uh, guideline. So please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. You are the Father of all creation. We approach you with awe and reverence, knowing there is power in your name and in your words. And yet we do approach you because you love us and have made a way for us to come before you through Jesus. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. This world is broken. People wage war against each other. Disease runs rampant. Drought and flood afflict the land. The people are broken. Our bodies fail through age and illness, and we suffer from mental health struggles, loneliness, abuse, and heartache. But Lord, you promise we will be made new. You promise us a time when there will be no more pain and sorrow, no more weeping, but only joy. We long for that day, Lord, when suffering will end and the earth and its people will be made glorious, when you will restore your creation and we will see you face to face. Give us this day our daily bread. Too often we take for granted many of the ways you provide for us, individually and collectively. We thank you for the food and the shelter that we have. Please help us to remember and care for those who will have no meal today and no place to rest their head. Thank you for the governments you have put in charge of our state and country. We recognise their efforts during this pandemic in trying to care for all people. Please continue to give them wisdom in their decision making and help them communicate clearly and honestly with each other and with the public. Help us to submit to those in authority, even though we may disagree with their decisions and question their motives. We know that you have placed them in their positions and you are working all things to your glory. We thank you that we live in a country with free public health care, that those who need medical treatment can receive it. We thank you for the doctors and nurses who work tirelessly to care for us when we are vulnerable to disease. Please give them renewed energy and strength as pressure on the healthcare system increases. 
We thank you for counsellors and volunteers who work with mental health organisations. Give them strength, wisdom and perseverance as restrictions and lockdowns continue to wear heavily on our minds. Give us all the strength to face each new day, knowing that you love us, you care for us, and you are in control of all things. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, we recognise that we are fallen people. We are sorry for the times when we rely on our own strength and wisdom to get us through instead of coming to you. We are sorry we push you out of our decision-making, our conversation, our daily lives. We are sorry we disrespect your word and the people you have placed around us and over us. Please forgive us. Help us to live more like Christ. Help us to forgive as Jesus did on the cross. He looked upon those who had abused and mocked him, beat and betrayed him, and still he forgave them as he hung on the cross in pain. Help us to forgive those who have wronged us, even if the pain still hurts. Help us to be compassionate to those around us, to those who are vulnerable, to those who are young. Teach us to take the time to really see the people and their needs and meet them where those needs are, not expecting more than they are able to give and helping where our abilities allow us to. As we read your word, align our wills with yours so that when temptations arise, we can stand strong in your truth. Through reading your word daily, help us to live lives that glorify you. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Well, all the power and the glory does belong to our God. And our next song is a reminder that God alone is unchanging through time. And that no matter what happens in life, we can trust our God who is the Ancient of Days.
God is the ancient of days. We have a few readings this morning, all coming from the book of Romans. The first one is from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 16. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need and practise hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. The second reading is from uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free... Sorry. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment of the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The next reading is from chapter 14, verses 1 to 4. Accept him whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And then verses 12 to 19. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification.
uh, we were first impacted by coronavirus, I haven't actually interrupted our sermon series through the books of the Bible because I've wanted to keep our gaze on God's word and his vision for life uh, and rather than allowing our earthly issues to dominate our horizon. But it's time because today, on Sunday, Daniel Andrews is presenting a road map out for our state. And if it's anything like uh, the New South Wales road map that was announced last Sunday by Gladys Berejiklian, and it probably will be, Um, then it will cause some in the Christian community considerable angst. So today, what I want to do is give us a theological framework to think through a number of the issues before us. What do the scriptures have to say about some of the issues facing us in these unprecedented times? Now, if you come out of this sermon thinking that I have told you what to think, then I haven't done my job properly, or you haven't heard me, or... Maybe probably it's a combination of both. So let me be really clear at the beginning. I have no interest in telling you what to think. I plan to give a framework for thinking. Um, At times I will give my opinion and I'll try and make that clear by saying things like, well, personally I think that, or it seems to me that... You know, So please hear me, I don't think this is the final word on the matter. These are reflections on and around some of the matters that COVID-19 has raised for us and I'm trying to provide some scriptural input into the ongoing conversation. So it's not an exegesis of any one particular passage, though Romans 13, 14 and 15 uh, are quite prominent, but uh, we'll be jumping around the scriptures a little bit and a lot of it will be coming up on the outline that's behind me. So um, yeah, you can take uh, the structure is really helpful and you can take down the scriptural verses as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're not living in this world alone and cut off from you and without your mind on the things that are most important. And so, Father, we pray that as we live in the midst of these unprecedented times for just about all of us, uh, things that have never come across uh, my lifetime of 50 years, but I know for many, uh, for those who are older, it's much the same. Uh, and yet your word still speaks to them. So, Father, pray that you'd give us wisdom as we jump into your word and hear what it says and how it impacts some of the things that we're dealing with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, many people have asked me, well, what is God doing by bringing this pandemic upon the world? Is God acting in judgment upon a world that has turned its back on him? Uh, is, it ta- is it a test for the church to see how it will handle the challenge? Or is this a pestilence, a, a sign that we're in the last days? Well, I'm no prophet, and God doesn't raise up prophets like he did in the Old Testament times to say, thus says the Lord. But having said that, the Bible does say plenty, and it does provide some answers. But if you're looking for a specific word from the Lord on this pandemic in 2020, 2021, then you'll be disappointed. The Bible says that since the first human pair turned their backs on God, that the world is under a curse. This is a fallen world. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, the human task of having dominion over the world and enjoying uh, life and the fruit of our labour is frustrated by thorns and thistles and painful toil. We're moving on one in the outline there, Ben. Um, this is a world where there is sickness and disease. That's, that's part and parcel of living in a world separated from God. This is not the Garden of Eden. Now, for those who'd like to nail the pandemic down more particularly as God's response to a particular sin in recent times, well, unless you can see into the very mind of God, that would be a very bold prediction. And especially where the impact of this virus is just so widely spread, it would be crazy to limit the cause to any particular sin, whether that be of the nation or of, a Western, of the Western world or the pagan world or the Eastern world or the Arabic world. This is not the first pandemic, and while the Lord doesn't return, it may not be the last. But what about then whether this pandemic is an indicator of the last days? I want to say that theologically, uh, we have been in the last days, or the days of the Spirit, ever since the Lord ascended to the heavens and poured out his Spirit. That's what marks the fact that we're in the last days. It's the period of the time between the Lord's ascension to heaven and his imminent return. That's the period the Bible speaks of as the last days. Now, the disciples of the New Testament church, they believed that the Lord could return at any time. And they were right. He could have. 
And we also believe that the Lord could return at any time. And we are right, he could. Now some may find this way too general and therefore unsatisfying to their appetite. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't have a specific word to us. You remember uh, what Jesus said in Luke 13 when people approached him about the innocent people who died when Pilate slaughtered some of the Galilean Jews. Jesus said, well, it's not because they are worse sinners than anyone else. He was effectively saying it's because we're in a fallen world. He says this is a reminder that we need God. It's a reminder that we will all suffer and die sometime and we should repent lest we eternally perish. Is the pandemic a sign? Yes, I think it is. Is God trying to tell us something through the pandemic? Yes, I think he is. What is God's purpose in this pandemic? That humanity would recognise this world and we individually are fallen. We're alienated from God and we need to repent of our sin and be reconciled lest we perish eternally. It's incredibly humbling, isn't it? Because in Genesis chapter 1, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Now, when you think of the spread of the coronavirus across the face of the earth and the impact it's having on humanity at the moment, it doesn't look much like we're having dominion, does it? We're masked up. We're locked down and locked out, and the virus continues to invade and spread. But at the same time, we can actually look at human civilization and see that in many ways we have had dominion over the earth. Uh, God created us in his image, and he created us with a very big brain that over centuries and centuries has developed farming techniques and transportation that has meant that we're not vulnerable to the seasons or to any particular local environment. Let's call this the scientific endeavour. God's general grace to all humanity, believers and unbelievers alike, a grace that enables human beings to understand our environment and to develop ways of managing the natural resources to enable civilization and human flourishing. Of course, I'm not just talking about farming and transportation, but education and communication and construction and administration and and the arts and entertainment and recreation and medicine. You don't see chimpanzees or whales understanding their anatomy and their physiology and their immunology and then developing medicines and antibiotics and vaccines to have dominion over the diseases or the infections or the viruses that might plague them. But humanity does have that capacity. And I'm sure that you make really good use of it. At least you do when you're sick. So recently, um, I slammed my finger in the car door There was a really deep throbbing that prevented me from thinking about anything else that I was trying to do that day. So I took a painkiller. Now, did I know how those pharmaceuticals were working in my blood system and my brain? No, very little idea. But it was welcome relief, and I thank God for the development of ibuprofen and for the Therapeutic Goods Administrator that gave me a confidence that it not only worked, but that it was safe. But a couple of days later, and the swelling of my finger was quite marked. Had I broken my finger? Would I lose my nail? What should I do? Should I Google it? Well, I could, uh, but then I'd have to sift through the advice and decide for myself, well, what's good advice, what's bad advice? So instead, I went to my doctor, who has seen and treated a good many of these before, and I learned that I had continued bleeding and it was putting pressure under the nail and it could well lift it off. And so she drilled some very fine holes uh, to relieve that pressure. Great. And a couple of days later, it started to get infected. And now I'm on antibiotics and the healing journey is almost complete. Praise God for doctors when something as simple as a jammed finger gets complicated. And praise God for doctors when we suffer something much more complicated, like leukaemia or meningococcal disease or a heart attack. 
and praise God that when there was a pandemic, the resources of the developed world were thrown quickly at developing vaccines that seemed to be safe and effective at reducing transmission of coronavirus, at reducing the severity of the illness and reducing the incidence of death as a result of the illness. Now this is not to say that all scientific development is good or that science itself can provide an ethical framework for its application to life. And I know that some people are not convinced that the vaccines are safe and some people are not convinced that they are effective. Can I encourage you to speak to your doctor about that? You entrust them with other matters that relate to your anatomy and your physiology and your immunology. They have given themselves to the scientific endeavour and they've studied long and hard into God's world using the human brain that God has given. Why not hear them out on this one? And then keep evaluating your decision, of course, uh, because there is actually a worldwide experiment going on at the moment and it's been going for nine months and across the whole planet and there are millions of subjects randomly selected and the evidence is still streaming in about these vaccines. So it, it makes for interesting observation. But I know, for many... The biggest issue is not whether the vaccine is safe or effective, but the biggest issue has been the sudden increase in the state's ability to impact the operation of the church's community or even civil liberties. What do scriptures have to say about that? Well, in the first instance, the scriptures in Romans chapter 13 verse 1 say, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except that which God has established. And down in verse 4, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. Wouldn't it be lovely if um, these two things came hand in hand? You know, if the government always acted for the good of their people, then it would be really easy to submit to their good direction. But what if it was a pagan government? Oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> the Roman government was a pagan government. And both Paul and Peter as well, you remember from a few weeks, weeks back in 1 Peter chapter 2, commended submission to the government as to the Lord. You see, our God is a God of order. The world he created works in an ordered way. And human society flourishes when there's a degree of order. For human community to work well, there needs to be some form of government. If there were no road rules, there'd be no way that we could drive here and there at 80 kilometres an hour. And once there are road rules, well, you can't take things into your own hands and drive however you want. Chaos and anarchy uh, would inhibit the ability to trust one another and to care for one another. And so that is why we as Christians take submitting to governments quite seriously. Even an incompetent government, government. I mean, if we were all our own authority deciding whether this rule or that rule of the government was competent enough to obey or not, then it'd be really hard to live in society. Let's think about the state and its authority over the church. Because even before COVID, the state had some jurisdiction over the church. I mean, for example, the state child safe uh, practices for our child and youth ministries. Uh, we don't say, oh, hang on a minute. No, back off. We want our youth leaders to be able to hang out privately, one on one, with children and adolescents. No. On the contrary, we have really welcomed their laws and their wisdom. In some ways, we're ashamed that we didn't arrive at it first and prevent a lot of abuse in the institution of the church. So the state does have jurisdiction over the way the church operates. Churches must abide by occupational health and safety laws, superannuation laws. We have to submit to company laws for charities, including abiding by accounting procedures that ensure that the money that you give uh, towards the cause is used accountably and responsibly for that end. See, the Bible celebrates the role of the government exercising care for society, and the state has already had certain jurisdictions over the church. But what if the government mandates things that directly subvert the lordship of Christ and the commands of his word? Because Peter did say, submit yourselves to the Lord's, uh, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority. 
And Paul says that the governments have been instituted for the good of society. So there does come a time and place for civil disobedience. We saw it in the Old Testament no numerous times. I mean, in Egypt, the Hebrew midwives uh, disobeyed Pharaoh's command to kill uh, the newborn Hebrew boys. Think of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They refused to submit to Nebuchadnezzar's command to bow down and worship the golden statue. And then think um, of Daniel. He disobeyed King Darius's decree not to pray to any god or man apart from Darius himself. Civil disobedience right there. And we see it in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John were commanded by the Sanhedrin not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus, uh, they responded by saying, well, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. No, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. Historically, um, Christians have taken up civil disobedience when governments have explicitly commanded that which is contrary to the Lordship of Christ. There have been laws uh, floated just this week in the Victorian Parliament that will prohibit faith-based organisations from employing people on the basis of their faith. Now, these, uh, th there are laws coming into effect early next year that prohibit people from receiving counsel or prayer about unwanted feelings of sexual attraction or gender dysphoria. Sometimes it's a time for civil disobedience. But what about public health laws, public health laws regarding the COVID pandemic? Can we choose which one of those we're prepared to abide by and which ones we shouldn't? What about the fact that God tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 not to give up the habit of meeting together and the government at the moment is telling us that we can't meet together? Is this a time for civil disobedience? Well, it's true that the government has taken unprecedented authority over many of our community and private activities at this time. Who would have thought, I mean, two years ago, that the government would, could make enforceable directives about how many guests you have in your house, or whether you can visit your parents or your adult children, or whether you can open your business for trade, or whether or not your children can attend their school in person, or whether or not you can turn up to church. Of course, unless we realise that this authority was given to or taken by the government for the purpose of managing a temporary and life-threatening crisis, then it doesn't make any sense at all. This is where we're at, even this weekend. The government tells us that it has advice based on modelling that if we let the coronavirus run, then our hospitals, which were quite stretched even before COVID, would soon be overwhelmed. Now, we've been told that New South Wales is running already a very fine line. It's possibly reached its peak of infections. The peak of illness is still yet to come. And so governments insist that while vaccination rates are still below targets, any opening up at this point must be measured and gradual. And in order to get the most out of society opening up and to be careful not to overwhelm our hospital system, the government seems to be starting this opening up with people who are protected by the vaccination from getting so unwell as to require hospitalisation. This is what we're being told. And you probably know more on Sunday than I know on Friday when we're recording this. Some people may think that the government isn't actually acting for the good of society, but rather it's using the virus as a disguise for an evil desire to control the people and restrict their freedoms. Other people will concede that the government's trying to act for the good of society, but it's misguided and it's oversensitive and is therefore unnecessarily squeezing the life out of society. I read a piece of advice from an American Presbyterian pastor, Harry Reader, in a Table Talk devotion. He writes, he says, In cases where civil disobedience may be required, my pastoral advice is that Christians should never act independently, but should first seek the objective counsel of mature Christians and direct oversight, as well as wisdom from those in authority within our families and churches, as we respond to those in authority over us in the state. Well, as you know, at this stage, the Presbyterian Church of Victoria and your elders have been upholding the government directives 
in the belief that the state is actually seeking the good of the people under the threat of the virus, and in the belief that it is our Christian responsibility to, to submit to the state at this point in time. Yes, the government's directives may be clunky. We're sure they've got it wrong from time to time. Maybe they've been too risk averse. Maybe the restrictions have been too broad, not localised enough. But we don't think they have commanded what is against the Lordship of Christ and they certainly haven't persecuted the Christian church or singled it out more than other public, um, other public gatherings in these matters of um, coronavirus. And what's more, hopefully, in this democratic society, there will be an accounting for the way the government has handled the COVID pandemic. And at least, at the very least the government of our day will be subject to public opinion at the next election. In the meanwhile, people in our church will hold differing opinions on many of the matters I've raised. And the question is then, how do we relate to one another when opinions differ and tensions are high and tolerances are low, when we're all exasperated and exhausted? Well, in Romans 14 and 15, and I encourage you to read all of chapters 12, 13, 14 and 15 after the service. In 14 and 15, Paul raised quite a different matter that the early church was dealing with. Uh, we had some of it read just before. There were differing opinions as to how the Old Testament law should be applied in the New Testament community. Some people wanted to keep the Jewish uh, dietary food laws and observe the Jewish festivals and the holy days. Others considered them fulfilled in Christ and no longer necessary. Tensions were high, tolerances were low, and people were beginning to be exasperated with one another. Paul said, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarrelling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who doesn't eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord's able to make them stand. Uh, last week, if you were with us, uh, you, we heard Jesus praying for the unity of the Christian church from John chapter 17. And we agreed that our unity is in Christ and his truth revealed in the scriptures. Romans 14 and 15 grants freedom in secondary matters. Now, in May this year, uh, and that was uh, about five months after the vaccinations had begun in the UK, uh, the Presbyterian Church of Victoria's assembly resolved this, and I'm going to read it in full and quote, we resolve to affirm that the issue of COVID-19 vaccines is a, is a matter of liberty of conscience in accordance with some of the principles found in passages such as Romans 14 and the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 20. And the Assembly resolved to encourage those in the Presbyterian Church of Victoria to have themselves vaccinated at the earliest opportunity. I'm going to stop the quote there. The reason it wanted to do that is because uh, the evidence wasn't fully in about the transmission, but if it reduced the transmission of the virus, then it's an act of love towards others um, to take the vaccination, and love is the fulfilment of law. But next, it wanted to assure believers that this, is, this matter is a question of wisdom, not righteousness, meaning believers can come to differing views, and they wanted to urge believers to maintain love and affection for fellow believers who disagree with the stance that they themselves have taken. Brothers and sisters, we will think differently on these matters. However, that does not mean that church, our church, will be a free-for-all for everyone to turn up and just do whatever their conscience dictates. The elders that you have elected because you've recognised their godliness and wisdom, they have been and will continue to make decisions for this church according to their conscience before the Lord. They are men who have made denominational vows in addition to the congregational promises that you have made. They have an assembly over them. So pray for them and then respect their decisions for this church. Now, that might have implications that are uncomfortable for you. 
Uh, maybe those implications will be over you for a limited period of time of transition as uh, we continue to come from our current state of vaccination to 70% to 80%. Uh, see it as an exercise in honouring the Lord. And as in the words of Paul in Romans 14 verse 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Brothers and sisters, I, I want to close by coming back to our first point about what God is doing in this pandemic. He's reminding us that this world that we live in is fallen, that we personally are fallen and alienated from God, and that we need to repent of our sin and be reconciled to God, lest we perish, not from COVID, but perish eternally. Because Christ has triumphed over sin and death. This pandemic will end. In fact, all sicknesses, disease and death will end when Christ comes again and brings about the resurrection. The resurrection, some to just judgment, but those who've turned to Christ and have taken him as their saviour, they'll know the forgiveness of sins and they'll have eternal life in a creation that's not marred by sin. It's not cursed with a virus and it's not overshadowed by death. If we come out of the other side of this pandemic or these lockdowns, maybe even as early as next year. If we come out of it and you think that a vaccine has saved you, then I'm sorry about that because the pain and the hardship of the pandemic has actually been wasted on you. In God's purposes, it was actually meant to be a sign that you needed a saviour. I mean, I praise God for the vaccine. A vaccine may stop you from getting COVID. If you do get COVID, a vaccine will most likely stop you from getting it badly and dying, but you still will die one day. And you don't want to spend another day in the lockdown of sin and death. Come to the Saviour who has tasted death for us, who's conquered the grave for us, and has showered us with his love and grace and opens up to us his life, his freedom, his joy and his peace. Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wisdom of your word and we pray that you would give us your spirit that we might rightly understand it. Uh, Father, thank you that uh, it is not simply a rule book, but it reveals yourself and your saving purposes. Lord, help us in particular uh, to work out how to live in love towards our brothers and sisters in Christ how to respect the authorities that you place over us of our families, uh, our state and our church. And Heavenly Father, we pray uh, that um, the Christian testimony would be one of love and justice, um, of freedom and grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing the hymn, The Lord is King.
I trust that you've enjoyed our service today. I'm sure it's given you lots to think about. Um, please reach out to someone else and have a chat and um, discuss the scriptures that have been presented a little bit. And um, yeah, know that the Lord is King and He is in control. That's our wonderful comfort. Our services are whilst we have 20 in person. We'll continue to provide this online, of course, um, because the majority of our people can't actually meet in person. But if you'd like to do that for the 9 o'clock service and the 10.30 service, email the office. Um, uh, you can reply to the email that's sent out to you, the midweek email, uh, just to let us know that you will love to come and join us. Or otherwise, if it's the Connect service, there is a booking link that's online and um, uh, you can see that there on the screen behind me or you can uh, get it in your midweek news that comes out. I want to finish with Paul's words to Timothy in chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. And for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen.